What in the world do construction engineers do? Yes, I've been making a lot of videos recently about what it's like to be an engineer construction. So today will be a little bit more exciting. It's going to be a deeper look at to what entry-level engineers actually do. So I'll go over five things that you're going to need to do when you first start out. And this is from my perspective, a guy that's been working for a multi-billion dollar general contractor here in Hawaii and in the building industry. And if you love construction, you love money, or you love Hawaii, Feel free to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. And with that, let's get into the video. So task number one, you're going to need to read drawings and specifications. What are those? So both of these are part of your contract documents on a project. Your specifications are your written standards and procedures for each section of work that you're going to be doing. So you have a spec section for cast in place concrete, you'll have one for carpentry, you'll have one for glass, and each section outlines what you're supposed to be doing for each section of the project. Sometimes these specs are just copy pasted from old jobs, so you have to be sure that you're checking your specs and making sure that all the referred sections are still relevant. And reading specs is not your typical enjoyable reading, but there's a lot of good information in there and that's what you're going to be held to for the project, so you have to read it. And the drawings and the specs together are supposed to give the contractor everything that we need to know in order to build the project. So if you're doing buildings, you're going to have a bunch of different sets of drawings. You're going to have an architectural set, structural set, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, landscaping, life safety, and probably telecom. So you have all these different sets of drawings. They're probably coordinated, right? Nope. Or I guess I should say, not always. For the most part, unless you're doing the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing scopes, you'll probably be more likely just diving into the architectural and structural sets of drawings. It is important to see and know all of them, but especially if you're on a big job, it's really gonna be kind of hard to know all these sets of drawings. And if at this point in the video, you're feeling a little overwhelmed, like, I don't know how to read drawings, I've never read drawings, what am I to do? Don't worry. I felt the exact same way when I first started out. I was just so overwhelmed, I mean you're talking about hundreds of sheets of paper that you're supposed to know for this project. Just trust me, if you're doing your job, you're working hard, you'll get the hang of it. I'm thinking about doing a video about how to actually read drawings and go through that process. So if you're interested in that, feel free to comment below and let me know. But before that video, I'll give you a very brief overview of how the sets work. So likely you'll start off with your plan views, and which is essentially a top-down view of what you're building on the project. So usually this will be by floor, and it's just a broad overall view. And then from there, you'll have enlarged views that'll take each subsection of the big overall plan view and detail it out. Keep in mind that these enlarged views are going to be where you're probably going to get most of your information from and the information in the enlarged views normally govern what's on the overall plan view. So you have to double check that. But you can't just build the building by looking straight down at the plan. You got to look at the building face up and that's what's called an elevation. And even within the plan views and elevations, you're going to have even more magnified callouts for further details and sections. So a section is as if you're cutting straight through it and a detail will just be a blown up area of kind of what you're looking at. Understanding your details and cut sections will really help you on your project. That's probably one of the most important sheets in the whole set. And typically towards the end of your set, you'll have some sort of schedule. So not like a, at 7 a.m. you're gonna do this, 8 a.m. you're gonna do this. Not that kind of schedule. It's basically just a list or a table of what's happening on the project. So it could be a door schedule where it lists out each door, the size of each door, what the rating is on each door, what the jam details are, things like that. Or it could be a finish schedule that tells you which room has what paint, what type of flooring, what type of base, that kind of thing. And we can't forget the all holy general notes. A lot of people forget to read the general notes. It's kind of similar to like the terms and conditions that you're supposed to read before you like sign up for something. But a lot of times there's a lot of typical details and things in the general notes that you will still be held to so you need to check that all the time. The more thorough you are with the drawings, the better of an engineer that you'll be. But there will be times that the specification and drawings don't have all the information that you need to build the job and I'll go over that a little bit later. So task number two, field quality control. To me, one of the most important parts of being an entry-level engineer. Field QC talks about maybe measuring dimensions of maybe your door openings in concrete or stud framing, making sure that your forms are set so you have the correct concrete thickness, overall layout, making sure that all your mechanical, electrical, and plumbing are coming out in the right spot inside the walls. But how do you know what to check? At the end of the day, you're going to be held to your contract drawings, and that's why I started with that, because you need to make sure that you understand these drawings and specifications so you know what's supposed to be implemented in the field. 
A big part of doing field quality control is you understand how things get built. You start to understand sequence. So kind of a tip, and maybe some people say that I went a little overboard with this, but I always made myself available to the guys in the field whenever they needed me. So like, I hated, I hated when people would come up and do their QC on something when everything was already done. Because it makes things so harder to fix if you find some kind of issue. And yes, some people will argue that the subtrades in the field or the contractors in the field are responsible for what they put in. And if we catch something as general contractors, you know, we're, we're just helping them out. But when you really talk about building a relationship with the guys in the field and really establishing yourself as like a good quality engineer that's actually there to help, most people aren't really gonna see it that way if you're coming at the very last minute. So if you're there throughout the process to see how everything is coming up and catching things along the way so that the rework that's done is very minimal, you make a very good name for yourself first starting out of the industry. And if you insert yourself into the field and do pretty good quality control, you'll likely get to see how some issues pop up in the field. And you're gonna get to learn and talk to the workers to see how to fix it and come up with ways that the design needs to change in order for it to be constructed. So being in the field helps to build that trust with the workers that knowledge about how things actually get built and it just helps you with conflict resolution and you can see how things that are drawn on paper don't actually work when they're actually trying to get built and that to me is the key of construction. People that skip this step and not spending enough time in the field get exposed as managers later on. I've seen it numerous times. These managers that don't have any grasp of what happens in the field just don't have the respect of the team. And it's construction. I mean, you gotta know how to build stuff. So I always took this part of the job very seriously. So now that we know the drawings and we know how things are working in the field, we'll also need to work on these things called submittals and RFIs. Let's start with submittals. So submittals are what the subtrades or you as a general contractor need to submit to the design team to show that you truly understand the contract documents. So that's in forms of product data to show that you're submitting the correct products for that are gonna be installed. It could be samples of tile, flooring, things like that to make sure that you're getting the right stuff. And shop drawings, which are drawn by each contractor of each trade. And these are usually more detailed and tell you how this thing is actually gonna get built. So again, in order for you to review all of these drawings, product data, you have to understand what's in your contract documents, drawings, and specs. And sometimes for me, I catch a lot of constructability issues in the shop drawing review process. So again, when you have that field background, it really helps you out when you start to do a lot of this more paperwork type of thing. And now we'll switch over to RFIs, which is a request for information. So kind of what I was talking about earlier, what if the drawings and specs don't have enough information for you to build? Or maybe the drawings and specs conflict with each other. Or maybe the electrical drawings show the room looking one way and the architecture shows another. Perfect questions for RFIs. As a contractor, you're basically asking for clarification from the designer to make sure that you're still building in an acceptable way. A lot of times when I issue these RFIs to the consultants, I'll call them ahead of time or I'll have a meeting in person just so that when they see that piece of paper hit their desk, it's not the first time they're seeing the problem. I find that this really helps with the communication and it also helps build that relationship with your designers to show that you're trying to be forward thinking and help them out. If you're just that person that waits till the screw up is in the field and then you're just asking a question with no solution, you're kind of lame. Part of being a good contract is being able to see things on two dimensions and foreseeing the constructability issues asking the appropriate RFIs before you finally get there in the field. That's the ideal situation. It doesn't always work out that way and you will have those RFIs that get generated from field issues. And that'll just be through your field QC process and hopefully you can keep that to a minimum because when you're solving problems when you're there in the field, you're losing schedule, you're losing productivity, and it's just not an efficient way to build. So task number four, Let's go into estimating and quantity tracking. So there will be some times when you start off as a contractor in the estimating department. I personally don't like this tactic or I personally don't like it if they shove engineers into the office because again, you're not getting that building knowledge. For me personally, I don't understand how you can price activities and understand how many labor hours go to something if you've never seen it built before. But likely they'll put you on something like counting how many towel bars are in the building or taking off how much concrete is in the building. And that's more of the front end work before you're even on the project. When you finally get on the job, you'll do what is called quantity tracking. And a lot of times you'll really dive into this if you're say self-performing work. If you as a general contractor are doing a certain scope of work on the job. So say if you're in charge of the concrete placement of the job. 
A lot of times you'll be tracking the actual concrete quantities that you're putting into the slab or any sort of concrete element. So I'll give you an example. A lot of times when you're doing foundations, if the subgrade is not prepped properly, you'll end up pouring more concrete than you're actually assuming you are. Because in the drawings it'll say maybe this footing is, you know, three feet by four feet by two feet deep. But if your guy that's prepping the subgrade for all of these foundations is cutting it down so you're six inches deeper than you're supposed to be, that's a lot of concrete that you can lose over all those different foundations that you have. So if you're tracking your quantities in the field, you'll see that you have a certain budgeted number for amount of concrete you're supposed to use in your foundations, and then you'll relate it to how much you're actually putting in the ground, and you can say, hey, what's going on? We should make a change. And to me, that's one of the most fun parts of construction is seeing how you can be more efficient and what things you can do on site to make more money. Because making money through being productive and careful planning is probably one of the most fun things about construction. And just a pro tip, there are a lot of programs out there where you have Bluebeam or you have AutoCAD, Revit, things like that, where you can do a lot of this quantity tracking just from your desk. Use a tape measure. The tape measure doesn't lie. If you go out and measure stuff, you'll one, find any issues if there are any, and two, you'll have the most accurate representation of the amount of thing that you're putting out out there. Just don't be lazy, go out and measure everything. And task number five, technology. Because you're an entry level engineer, a lot of people are thinking that you're kind of a younger person maybe, and you're supposed to be technologically savvy and you can pick up anything. So a lot of times there's new like robots and machines that come into play that they're gonna ask you to learn how to use. Maybe it's a specific program where you're modeling something. And just the electronic document control of all the files that you have on the project. When you're an entry level engineer, it's gonna be part of your job to manage. And to me, that's also why everything that I talked about before becomes so important because if you don't understand everything before you can't understand how to use technology to your benefit there's actually quite a bit of useless construction technology out there but the sales pitch sounds really good but when you really think about it and you understand how things are actually getting done the technology is kind of a waste of money in a lot of ways so just keep that in mind and well those are some tasks that you'll be doing as an entry-level engineer if you have any further questions on any of these things feel free to comment below i'll be sure to reply to you i hope you're enjoying these videos and if you are don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join our growing family here on youtube thank you so much for watching i really appreciate your time and i'll see you in the next video